All right, good to see everyone. And I think I've seen most of you already, but I'm sure there's some of you I haven't met. Uh, and as usual, there's about 70, 75%, an enormous number of people in the audience are usually attending for the first time. Can we see your hands again if you're a first time attendee? And I think that's awesome. And it presents a certain amount of challenges. And I think that uh, Dr. Blackstone especially did a great job this morning of giving quite a bit of background to kind of lead in. But there ends up being a lot of high powered science presented by some pretty amazing folks, the top people in the world, right? But it presents some challenges. So I did want to spend, I've got like four little kind of mini presentations to give. And some of it's to, you know, maybe some of it we should have in the beginning of a conference. And so your, your feedback is welcome as we kind of keep building a better conference. Should we have some of this as kind of pre-reading material or maybe even little videos before you guys come to conference that you might be able to watch, you know, in your homes or maybe on the plane or maybe in your hotel room before you come to kind of give you some of that jargon, some of that lingo and a little bit of the basics. So, you know, give us some of that feedback. So I'm going to step back, and I've, I've done it in other conferences, and it's been received pretty well. It's a little bit late in the conference to be doing it, but I'm going to kind of go back down to some of the basic genetics pieces so we're all on the same page, and I'll want lots of questions so that you can really take home as much of this material as possible. So you know, really kind of asking those questions is, is what I'm looking for. And very, very briefly on clinical trials. So again, I'm going to just touch the surface of some of basic genetics clinical trials. I'm going to go through some slides from somebody that was not able to attend. And my goal is if I do a good job of these basic genetic slides, you'll be able to understand what that gene discovery research is. And I'll even maybe quiz you a little bit. So if there's anybody that you know, wants to, to do well on a quiz, there, there's always those overachievers in the group. Please do. Um, I'm also then going to talk a little bit about the state of where we are with gene and cell therapy. And I am not going to be able to do it justice. But I will be able to summarize and give you trajectories, give you patterns, some of the things that we observe and that I, working in the clinical trials field, see day to day. That I've been speaking with some of the researchers here that they're seeing. Even if not all of it is public information, there is a lot of public information available. Okay, So I'm going to try to do that justice. But I want to leave plenty of time for questions because it's all about not what I want to tell you, but what you want to know. So. I, I, I want to know if you've got questions, whether it's in this room or outside of this room or even years later. Okay. So very fundamentally, DNA, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid. Is everybody aware that DNA is in every single one of your cells? All right. How many cells do you think you have in your body? Yeah, this is a very poor diagram of a cell. Dr. Blackstone earlier had the most beautiful cell picture I've ever seen, and I'm definitely going to have to steal it from him, but how many cells do you think are in your, the average person? Trillions, exactly, right? Now, if, if you've overeaten like I have over the years, you've got a few more cells maybe than I'd like, but you've got trillions of cells. Every single one of these cells has DNA within them, all right? DNA is the blueprint. Basically, you can make an entire cell from a copy of DNA that's located in every cell. Now. Whenever you say always in biology, it never means always, right? There's always 99%, right? So for instance, like red blood cells you may know don't actually have a nucleus, but almost every other cell in your body has this nucleus and you can make a full daughter cell from a division of a cell, okay? Not all cells divide, but most do, and they all have DNA, okay? And I'm gonna use a pointer, unfortunately the pointer doesn't go on both sides. If I was smarter, I'd, I'd use this, but uh, so, Within your DNA, how long do you think DNA is in each cell? I just kind of cheated by showing you, but <laughs> how much? You can say it a bunch of different ways. You can say it by, you know, a DNA molecule. You can say it by how long it is. What's a guess? A, me a meter. Well, somebody knows the answer. That's not fair. But can you imagine that a meter of DNA is in every single one of your cells? And it's so tightly coiled. And I heard yesterday somebody referring to how narrow axons are that go down your central nervous system and how you know, it's a 50th of a hair. Imagine how small that must be to be able to really pack all of that into each cell. So just imagine, this is really a mechanical marvel. And that's one of the things I want to talk to you about is, this is we're talking about structure and function here. Some of the things that I've been hearing the researchers say, it's very mechanical. It's almost like opening up a watch. 
maybe it's a bad example because I got an eye watch that's so maybe not as mechanical as most watches, but you know, we're looking at things that are gears and mechanisms and things that crawl along microtubules and things that break those microtubules. It's very, very mechanical. And so is DNA. So if you take DNA and you actually stretch in, in each nucleus and you stretch it out, that's basically what's in the bottom of your cell there. And that's got structure as well. You often hear about DNA being helical and it's kind of beautiful. And if I were to get a tattoo, I haven't yet, but if I were to get a tattoo, it'd probably be DNA first. Because um, it's a beautiful structure. It's neat. It's something that I get passionate about. It's, it's just kind of awesome. It's something I've learned over time. If you look at the actual composition as you stretch out that helix, you actually realize, and we only realized in the 50s, I mean, this was not that long ago, we discovered that DNA is made up of a code. And that code, you may be familiar with, who knows the code? Just the one letter codes? A's, G's, T's, and C's. I'm hearing it kind of all around, right? You basically have four letters. And now that stands for something that's a lot longer names, and I can list those, but that's not the point. It's a code, A's, G's, T's, and C's. It's just a repetitive four nucleotides. You could have A, A, C, T, G, A, T, C, T. It's a code. And it's literally that entire three meters is just repetitive of that code. And it's this code that drives everything that a cell becomes, which is kind of crazy. And here's how that happens. You basically have a DNA code that determines an amino acid code. Now, who knows what an amino acid is? Where have you heard amino acid? Building block of a protein. Maybe you've heard of amino acids like in like hair products or something, right? You know, enriched with amino acids or vitamins, minerals, things like that. It's, it's a basic building block. And if you string together a whole bunch of amino acids, you get a protein. Now, I say here in the title that proteins have structure and function, and that's what I really want you to take away, okay? And what I'll show you in the next slide is you've got a sequence of DNA and all that does is determine the sequence of a protein. And there's a whole bunch of steps in between. There's transcription, there's translation. We'll go through that when I have more than 15 minutes for just this piece. But just know that you're going from a DNA sequence to a protein sequence. And when you're looking at all of the function and structure that Dr. Blackstone showed earlier, that he's now able to image individual proteins, and he's looking to see that they move, and that they're folded around membranes and that it's part of a membrane folding and interaction process, it's because these proteins have structure and function. Does that make sense? Now, when you've got a change in your DNA, what do you think that does to the protein? It can change it, right? And I heard somebody say it can change its shape. Do you think it might change just its shape or maybe also its function? It can, right? Now, what we know is not all DNA changes result in changes in proteins, but certainly they do. And that's what we're talking about. When you've got a change in your DNA, that's why it's inheritable, and that's why you have a risk of passing it on to future generations. And it's directly because it can influence the proteins that it makes. And it can alter their structure, and it can alter their function. When you think of proteins, think of like this, or this, or this gnome that's here that my family brought that we're kind of exploring San Antonio with. It's a thing that has structure and function. It's making an appearance. You can take pictures of it. We've been taking pictures of it all. It's got structure and it's got function, okay? It's like, think of um, these lights or the two by fours that are in your house. A microtubule is structural. It provides structure for a cell wall, for inside, for along an axome. It provides substance, no different from the building blocks of your house. There are some proteins that are shaped kind of like a light switch on the wall, and they literally turn on and they turn off, and they interact like keys in a lock. There are about how many, you think, genes and proteins in, in a body, in every cell? Anybody know? You guys have gotten a lot of answers right so far. Not everybody needs to know this. It's okay. How many? How many? How many different types of genes, proteins? It's, a, it's approximate. About 23,000. Some people think maybe a little bit more. We're still, there, there's, there's still some that's unknown about that. But literally, to make functional cells and people and flies and mice, 
you need about 23,000 different types of proteins. And they work together in amazing ways. We heard Dr. Honda talk about how many different uh, different protein-protein interactions she, that we didn't know about before that she found and is now finding may have significance. There's an unbelievable amount of proteins and they're working together just like all the pieces of your house work together to, to, to form a functional house. There's structure and there's function. Does that make sense? And I kind of want you to understand that there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of challenge in figuring out what that structure and function is, but think of cells as little mini machines. And we're trying to figure out what the heck is wrong in many cases, and it can be very complex. Okay? I don't want to dwell on that too much. Questions? Okay. This is the, the, the exact same thing that I just said, but it's, it's basically showing at the top, you've got a DNA sequence. And at the bottom, you've got an amino acid sequence that makes a protein. And again, that protein has structure and function. And all you're doing is literally, with your first letter, second letter, and third letter, of reading triplets of DNA sequences, you figure out what the amino acid is. In the lab, if somebody gives me a DNA sequence, I can usually predict what the expected protein sequence is going to be. And that's how we can predict disease, OK? And if there's questions, let me know. We usually do a longer version of this. We decided not to this time. But again, give feedback in the conference if, if this sort of thing is useful, either previous or you know, maybe early in the conference. OK. A couple of other types of changes in DNA are more than just single changes in a base that you can imagine would influence one part of a protein. You can actually have whole chunks of chromosomes that either are deleted, that are inserted, that are flipped, that are moved around. Do you think that these might have consequences to proteins and structure and function? Yeah, some do. Some might not, right? Not necessarily all areas are, are going to result in a change. But often, they will result in a change. And so that can be, again, a diagnostic that can be a smoking gun for something that might be wrong. Those are things that we look for in the lab, OK? All right. Now, way too brief and oversimplified, but just a very brief overview of clinical trials because we've talked some about this, and this is an enormous source of frustration for a group like us who want action. But just so that you know, as a, as a society on the human Earth planet, there have been some pretty awful instances where human experimentation was done and it was not OK. And a lot of that is what's driving rules, regulations, and ethics of being able to conduct studies for therapies that can help critical groups like ours. Okay? So we don't want you to think that anybody is looking to slow down progress just to get in the way. It's because there's darn good reasons for a lot of those rules. And you guys probably know, I mean, World War II is a pretty good example, right? I mean, it's some pretty atrocious things have happened to humans in the past. And we've got to be careful. And the primary thing we've got to be careful about is looking out for safety. We want to make sure you don't hurt somebody. So if you look at what's called a phase one trial, generally, as evidenced by this chart, and this will be in videos, this will be all available. It's, if you just go to clinicaltrials.gov, I think somebody mentioned that earlier, you know, you'll, you'll see some of this information. Okay? The purpose of a phase one trial is only safety. And I think we heard Frank McCune talk yesterday that one of the drugs, noscopine, that he's looking at has already been determined to be safe. So in some ways, that's got a jump start, right? You already know that certain doses over certain time have been determined to be safe. That's already passed through that phase. I don't know if it has been by the US FDA, but certainly other places where that kind of medication has been given. All right? And we can use that past knowledge we don't have to do a phase one clinical trial there necessarily, unless you know, there's some good reason that, that we would want to, or a higher dose that maybe hasn't been approved or tested. But that phase one is all about safety, because that's where you got to start. If you don't have safety, we're not going to go further. Uh, we, 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 even if it's effective, it doesn't matter. It's causing some other problem, OK? So then phase two. And that's where it gets tricky, because that's where there's kind of a traditional model for clinical trials, where there's lots of people that might be sick. Think of diabetes. It's like part of the population, right? It's a good chunk of the population. 
or you know, some very common diseases or illnesses like you know, the flu or something, right? Where you're looking to do a trial to see if something's effective. You've got big populations you can draw upon. And you can put together what's called a placebo group. Anybody know what placebo is? Someone that's tr a population that might be treated with something that is not the drug. And why do you want to do that? Why would you want to do that kind of, well, that sounds cruel and unusual, right? That you would have a population that would not be treated intentionally. Why? As a control, right? Wow, that's, uh, you, you, guys, you, you guys know this. So a control group, you want to know if there's going to be a difference with the folks that were treated with the drug. You want to see a difference. How would we see a difference? What are some ways that you might see a difference? Decrease in symptoms. Excellent, excellent. Now, what might be a decrease in symptoms with our issues in this room? Mobility? I, I, yes, you just said mobility. That's fantastic. And I think we heard Frank say that yesterday, right? Maybe even just like there, there are apps on your iPhone, and my iPhone monitors when I'm out walking. It does a better job than anything I could imagine 10 years ago. That might have some clues, and I think he's looking into that. And I think, uh, you know, certainly Dr. Fink for years has been looking at just gait, like, you know, a mat across. To, to look at changes in gait. We saw mouse models presented earlier where you can see that there's differences. These are all important things that you can measure versus a control group. But now when you've got a PLS population where there's just even in this room a handful of people that have PLS, what's the control group? Why, well, you, the, 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 you might have to rethink in a rare disease what that study setup looks like. And I'm already spending too much time in the slide, but I want to kind of talk about what some of those challenges are and how that model with the FDA is, is changing somewhat. I think that the FDA, I don't want anybody to see the FDA as an obstacle here. They are reaching out to us. They're engaged, we heard Frank say that yesterday. They're reaching out, they're trying to engage with advocacy groups like ours to make sure that we're appropriately serving that population. And it might be with things like looking at natural history instead of a placebo control. That's why everybody's talking about natural history and how that's important. Now, the problem is if you've got natural history and it takes 10 years to get worse, you don't want a clinical trial that's going to go on 10 years or you won't have approval. You know, we want this to help us. We want this to help our children. We, want, we, we, we need something that's, that's, that's going to be timely. But these are some of the reasons why we have to be careful and some of the reasons why time can go on. Does that make sense? Questions about that? At a high level, I, I, I don't want to go much more than that. We could go more in depth and if that would be useful, uh, we can probably get people that are way better qualified than me to do it. But uh, those are some of my, my thoughts on, on how it looks. Um, OK, so remember, I gave you this background on basic genetics. So now we're going to switch to somebody else's presentation. Stefan Zuckner uh, spoke last year. He's amazing, great colleague. Um, I, I have all the admiration in the world for him, and I'm going to try to do some of his slides justice, but I'm hoping that that prelude is going to help you be able to walk through these slides even more effectively. Go ahead and hit the next slide. So I think we, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I think there, there's been a few folks up on this stage that have mentioned that there's an explosion of genes that have been identified for HSP, right? Uh, there's a lot of genes that cause it. We're still struggling to find some of the genes that are responsible for PLS. We've got hints of those, and I think Dr. Fink will probably talk about some of those later. But there is an explosion. There's a lot of genes that are either associated with or directly known to be causal, right? If you have a mutation in these genes and you end up having that protein have an altered structure or function, that's a smoking gun we're looking for to say, there you go, all right? You've got HSP, and that can be a positive diagnosis that, that can help you uh, get the kind of help that you're looking for. So it's an explosion, right? The next serious piece, obviously, is, is looking for therapies. Next slide. There was a gene identified by Zuckner and, that, and, and, and his team, and that's the, the basis of, of this presentation, right? That's, that's what he's, he's trying to drive home. This is a gene, UVAP1, that's been identified globally via what I would say should be encouraging to this group. A lot of data sharing, a lot of sample sharing, a lot of things where people could definitely claim more of their turf. And things went right here to say, all right, we're going to collectively look at all these samples from all over the world to find additional 
genes that maybe are rare, but are causal. And that's important as we, I mean, we just saw earlier, we saw you know, a mapping of all the different genes and how they are actually common within a pathway of folding within the ER. It's important to know what all these genes are, and it's important to work together, and it's important to publish that and to share that so that you can understand the overall mechanisms, what's going on, because then we can figure out what might be a common source of therapy there, right? If it's ER folding, and that's an important source where we can have a therapeutic piece that's going to help, great, maybe even independent of gene. So there's a lot of good things that happen in this study to show. And one thing I would say about uh, Stefan Zuckner's work to it, and this is through the University of Miami, so a lot of you, and even outside, right, you can give your blood. It's, it's, it's the group that's working on that that I'm talking about here. And he has a ethos to share all of that data. He's made a platform that researchers can tap into, and that's the whole basis of the power of what he's looking to build. And he's expecting that more and more people will put in their data, and so it ends up growing into something that's awesome forever. Cool? Good, good concept? That's what's coming from this, okay? So this is a global study. It's, it was global collaboration. And basically, there's n most of the easy genes have already been found. It's kind of surprising that there's so many families that are out there that end up having this gene. So go ahead, next slide. Now, here's, oh, it may be very hard to see, but this is where that preview of genetics might be able to help you, okay? So what is shown here, who sees the tree? Like up top, you kind of see these branches and you see dark dots and light dots. What is that? Anybody know? Sorry? Yeah, family tree, right? Just uh, This is a genetic counselor tool. It's, uh, you'd probably see it like Ancestry.com, right? It's, it's, it's leaves on a tree. And so all of these are huge families. And families are great at tracing genes because you can look and see if something is recessive, something is dominant, if you're seeing skipping generations. If you're able to trace through generations a disease, that means there's something to find in those genes right, that are affecting structure and function. And what they're seeing in these multiple families are a change. Now, what is that change? Where are you seeing the change? And I'm, on this side, I'm going to cheat a little bit and show right here. Can anybody see the change? It looks like spikes of green, red, black. Anybody know what that is? And right above it is a sequence. Do you know what that sequence is? Sorry? It's the gene code. It's the DNA sequence. And I'll point over here as well. So I'm showing right here, right? So in this family, they sequence the DNA of those individuals, and they're seeing a change. So what's significant about that change? We just talked about it. If you've got a DNA change, what's going to happen? A protein. And a protein that has structure and function. I don't know yet the structure or function of this gene. I don't think that Stefan Zuckner knows yet, but that's the next thing that he'll be working on, right? We'll understand how that fits into the whole. And actually, I think maybe the next slide, there's already been a publication on this gene where they didn't know it was connected with HSP. That tells a little bit about its function. But what you can see here is I've, you were able to look at this slide and understand more about it just by knowing, all right, here's the DNA sequence. Here's why it's important. And you end up finding that in multiple families there are different DNA changes that have different impacts on the protein, but the commonality is if you screw up that protein, you end up getting disease. Make sense? Okay, and you can determine more about the inheritance pattern by look, literally seeing this is following in generations, right? So there is a direct relationship that indicates that it's, it's dominantly inherited. And I'll talk about dominant and recessive inheritance probably another day. Um, and there are actually on our website uh, past um, in modes of inheritance uh, videos that you can watch. So I'd be, I'd be able to, to point you to those. Uh, next slide. So here's all the different changes, right? They're kind of in a hot spot in what's called exon 4. I didn't talk about exons. Don't worry about that. This is gene structure. This is your DNA. And it ends up that multiple changes, any way that you screw up this protein, you end up having similar phenotypes. Okay? And it's allowed us to understand the mechanism uh, by which it causes HSP. And they're looking to develop this test therapy in mice. It's a beautiful thing. They're probably going to be working with uh, Dr. Blackstone or some of his colleagues. 
Next slide. This is the article that I was recalling he was pointing to. He didn't necessarily know at the time that this was connected with HSP, but there's been some work on this protein, and they're obviously immediately reaching out to these folks to say, hey, did you know we happen to find this in multiple families and there's a strong link, <laughs> really even causal, with HSP? Uh, that's a, a pretty amazing kind of scientific collaboration that's gonna result in, in uh, uh, clinical diagnoses and hopefully directions toward therapy. That's kind of the messy science work, right? It's not linear. <laughs> it's very, you wind your way and you find the truth, right? It's not necessarily directional. This group had no idea probably it was connected with a disease. Questions? That's it for that. And I'll be going back to my slides here now. Questions about that? So that's how a new gene is identified. And a lot of times, this is in, in some ways kind of an old school way that genes are identified. A lot of times now, we're able to sequence entire population. We could sequence everyone's genome in this room in a matter of weeks as opposed to years, just a few years ago. It's more possible to generate that data than it is to crunch through. We were talking about that a little bit this morning, right? It's, it's harder to crunch through that and understand clinical significance than it is to do it. We've actually got the equipment in my lab to do things you know, a million times faster than even just a few years ago. So we're, we're, we continue to uh, accelerate that pace of discovery. Okay, I've taken way too long so far, but I am through two of my sections. So I've only got two more left. One of the things I was asked to do at this point, and it's why I'm kind of late in the schedule, is to just very briefly review some of the things that I'm hearing from talks and maybe restate them in slightly different words. Um, and I will be very brief, but I can, I can definitely talk with you more about this. We can, and again, give feedback. As you give feedback about this conference, let us know if, if this is helpful and if we should do more of this and maybe even after the conference. So just very briefly, I'm gonna go through a little bit of what I heard. So SPF leadership and organization presented um, some about our organization, some about what some of our important initiatives are. And I would say it's for me is that this is our foundation, right? It's not my foundation, it's not just the board's foundation, it's ours. That's the whole idea behind it. And you're gonna see that as themes, as, as we start to have therapies come on board, it's gonna be even more important that we stick together as a group, because collectively, we have power, we have more voice. I heard from uh, Dr. Mitsumoto earlier, right? What do, we, what do we do to make PLS more front and center? And it's by raising your voice. This, this is the group that's gonna raise our voice and it's gonna be together, not individual. You can do it as individuals, but I think we're better together. We can do both, right? You can also speak up alone, but that's the idea, right? It's our organization. And we shape what's needed together and what we need in five years might be very different from what we needed five years ago. And get involved, right? Everyone in this room is having challenges, but get involved. Hopefully that can help. And if you can't get involved yet, Get involved in the ways that you can, or bide your time, that's fine, right? We all wanna be able to help each other and everyone's at different stages. All right, a little bit uh, from Frank McCune, and there's way more words here. I am not gonna read through these words, but basically, I have gotten more out of talking with Frank than, than he probably realizes, and maybe he does, because he's, he's an awfully bright guy. Um, the HSP Research Foundation is the Australian version of us, and they are fueling energy into clinical trials. And they're making a very direct, I just said science is kind of messy and winding. He's following that messy and winding path. He's also making a beeline toward clinical trials as fast as he can. And it's admirable and it's great. It's a slightly different direction from what we're doing here. And that's sort of the power of science is we can take multiple directions, okay? It's something that we're actively talking about. So his driving question is, what is it gonna take? He doesn't necessarily know the answer, but he knows that's a driving question, right? It's a hub for the HSP community, kind of like it is uh, uh, us here, uh, but in Australia. They're looking to facilitate, they're looking to fund research, find a treatment that's highly effective, widely available, readily affordable. Those are very carefully chosen words, and they have meaning to him, okay? And they have meaning for all of us. Uh, he's working with, uh, I would say, uh, quasi-celebrity, right? Dr. Alan McKay-Sim, who is pretty phenomenal. He's been voted uh, uh, Australian of the Year. Before. I mean, he's, he's just, he's off the charts, right? And he's working in a very specific kind of cell, cell model, uh, olfactory stem cells or uh, ONS cells. And they were looking at 
differential expression in that in these cells that, uh, that have HSP, they're seeing pretty significant misrepresentation, uh, misexpression of, uh, in, in those cell lines. And they see commonalities, right, to, to microtubule genes. And, and he's talking about the fact that spastin severs microtubules and that they're, they're actually looking at biomarkers of acetylation being down, uh, of uh, alpha tubulin, slower paroxysomal movement on those cells. We saw that. We saw even better quality images today through Dr. Blackstone, but it's the same kind of idea, right? Increased oxidative stress. These are all things that can be measured in those cells, and he was talking about that. And he's talking about that in, in reversing or, or in tubulin binding drugs, you actually can reverse and restore acetylation of alpha tubulin and speed up some of those paroxysome movements and reduce oxidative stress. And it's with a couple of drugs that he's able to do that. And I mentioned one of those is already, the safety's already been determined and it's actually uh, uh, was a pretty commonly available cough suppressant or something, right? It's, it's, it, it was used in a whole different way before, but it's something that might end up having some impact. It has some impact in these things that are being measured. What's completely unclear is, is that gonna help anything? And the way that you determine that is through a clinical trial. And that's why I gave kind of that primer on clinical trials of what's next. What do we need to build to do that next? That's what he's actively going toward. What are we gonna measure? What's an outcome measure? What are you comparing it against? How big of a sample size is that? He's working through all those in a very passionate way uh, as urgently as possible. And that's gonna help us all. Uh, there are some really good questions about next steps in clinical trials and really a theme that the FDA is really willing and able and is representing that they're going to go uh, bend over backwards. Um, the, the FDA director who unfortunately just left has probably had more of an impact than, I, than anyone would expect in a government agency. He really, in a lot of ways, and, and I'll go through some of the state of the art of, of, of clinical trials that are happening now and approvals that are happening. He's kind of changed the game, and now he's on his way out, but I think that that ripple effect that, uh, uh, th that he's had is going to persist for a while, really focusing on some of these rare diseases and new models and things that you know maybe would have caused slowdowns because it's a little bit different from normal where you're doing a diabetes or, or a cancer study that, that can be quite large. It's, it's embraced kind of some new models. And so we've re we really see that the FDA has ready been over backwards and we're seeing approvals of things that are new modes of therapy. A little bit that we uh, got from uh, Dr. Peter Bass. Uh, he was focused on mice, but really I think he did a great job of, of backing up and giving some of that background and showing some pictures and kind of leading us through some of that science. And he was talking about the fact that, you know, HSP may be a similar set of phenotypes, but as a basic scientist, kind of like me, I'm not a clinician, right? I'm looking at kind of from the gene level, and I would name things differently. And, and you know, they're kind of named for the clinical phenotype, but I would name it differently. Everyone names things a little bit differently and categorizes them differently. And so he was ask, asking some pretty fundamental questions about, you know, maybe these are different underlying causes. Is, is it even one disease? And that's where I would expect, you know, Dr. Fink to come up uh, uh, later on this afternoon, and he speaks to that in incredibly well, right? He has a good, firm understanding of that, and he's probably the best one to address some of those pieces. And he's asking about, uh, with, with some of these uh, uh, genes that he's looking at, especially he's interested in SPAST. And I think you, you heard SPASTIN, SPAST, SPG4, they're all kind of the same thing that kind of points to that nomenclature issue, and that can get in the way, right? When we talk about those things interchangeably, it can really get in the way, but that's not the intention, right? The intention is to be able to communicate but, and that's where, you know, maybe we need to have a cheat sheet before we all come to conference here of what the heck do all those things mean? Somebody asked what ER is. And then we got a beautiful explanation this morning that went into detail of, of ER, right? It's endoplasmic reticulum and it's an organelle and it's got shape and structure and function, but it was a question at the time. So, you know, again, let us know what we need to provide for next time. Um, he was talking some about uh, loss of function, which is haploinsufficiency, and I can talk a little bit about that. We talked about DNA driving protein changes. What if you have deletion of a gene? You think that might have an impact? It might, right? It might not because, remember, you get one copy from mom, one copy from dad. So if you've got deletion of one, you've still got the other one, right? And it's probably fine because chances are very low that you've got two bad copies. 
not zero, definitely not as a chance of zero. But do you think that might be a problem? In some cases, it is. Sometimes having too much or too little can be just as wrong as having something that's incorrect. Is that cool? Does that make sense? OK. So that's called haploinsufficiency. If you've only got one copy, maybe it's making less protein. Maybe that's not enough to do its job. When you've got you know, a huge long axon, maybe it's not enough to get the job done. That's what's meant by haploinsufficiency. Or gain a function, where you've actually got a change in the protein and often it's called toxic gain of function. You can have some sort of mistake. Maybe all of a sudden, that light switch doesn't switch anymore, right? Maybe it's sticky. Maybe it's stuck on. And that could be a gain of function. That light switch is on. Maybe it's a key that's stuck in a lock. And you can call that a gain of function because it's, it's stuck there. It's doing something it wouldn't otherwise do. It's just ways that we try to understand how things are going wrong in these cells. Does that make sense? OK, he was talking some about that. And he was talking about gain of functions being troublemakers. They can do kind of crazy and unexpected things, like a light switch that doesn't go anymore, or a lock that doesn't turn anymore, right? Same kind of idea. He was talking about, and I heard uh, some folks out in the hallway yesterday talking about the fact that this dieback model of, of, axons, of axons is kind of an interesting way, a new way that people have thought about, oh, I didn't realize that maybe stuff isn't getting all the way down because there's kind of this dieback. And that's an interesting concept. I think it's, it's good as you think about things in structure and function. It's very mechanical, right? Maybe it's not that there's a problem all along. Probably is a problem all along. But it can be seen as like a pulling back. It's not quite getting its job done. And if it's just a little bit short, maybe that's not enough, right? And so that could have therapeutic implications. If all you need to do is correct a little bit more, that could be great for response to therapy. Who knows, right? That's what, some of those things we don't know until we try. OK. And there was a lot of thanks uh, from him that you know, dollars are being used as effectively as possible. And thanks for us and the money that we raise uh, uh, to, to Im improve and, and fund some of his work. Uh, very quickly, um, there is a, a lot from uh, Dr. Hund. Um, and I would say that the highlights for me is that you know, she was, wanted to focus on the importance of upper motor neurons and that they're not in the dark anymore, and that we are identifying biomarkers. And that there's, I mean, she's made strides toward developing novel drug discovery and verification platforms using a survival model. And that's something that's really interesting to see. Um, that we're beginning to discover novel compounds that can improve upper motor neuron health. Um, there were questions about, you know, does timing of therapy matter? I think that's very insightful. Questions about blood-brain barrier. I think all of those are just fundamental questions that this group has, and it's important to ask those, so please do. And just a few of my notes from uh, uh, Dr. Blackstone this morning, who's obviously, uh, you know, I'll probably embarrass him, but he's, he's a hero of mine. Um, SPG11 and 15 is a common recessive form of HSP, can have complex phenotypes. Uh, there are people in this audience I know that are just absolutely passionate, making great strides towards getting more light shed on this disease, right? This is, this is a, a driving force. Uh, that there's a new class of disorders that, that really are, are disorders of lysosomal biogenesis. Uh, that several, uh, many HSP genes are important for ER shaping. That's important for axon formation and maintenance. Uh, he looked and showed us beautiful images of mouse models with relevant phenotypes in which we can test therapy of efficacy and how well is it going and, you know, dosage and, and so forth. Uh, some super resolution imaging technologies that are being applied to that ER imaging. I'd never really seen that kind of 3D stuff. It's almost like watching a documentary, right? It's, it's, uh, and we probably will see it in a documentary uh, uh, one of these days soon. Um, and that you know, this, this newly discovered non-continuous ER that seems to be detectable, where previously it wasn't, either because things are rapidly changing, we just didn't have the resolution, or be able to rapidly image uh, the, the way that, that he can. And he showed us some seven color imaging that can show complex organelle interactions in a cell. And I'm sure he's able to apply that to lots of different areas. But he's here in this room because he's applying it to HSP and PLS. And that's a powerful thing. And that's important. And he's one of the lead people at the NIH. So there are questions about the natural history study for SPG4, SPG3, uh, SPG31. He pointed us to clinicaltrials.gov for uh, inclusion in some of those uh, natural history studies. 
uh, a little bit about what I was hearing from Dr. Mitsumoto is results focused on PLS, right? He's been a real pioneer and important thread of PLS uh, for, for many, many years. And there's a lot of people that he works with and we've funded some clinical fellowships in PLS to help bolster that clinical research presence. And I think that's been an important part of our advocacy for PLS. Uh, he's talking about his COSMOS study. That's a, a 20 center study that's focusing on data from PLS patients. And that um, uh, they're also studying, obviously, in collaboration with a lot of ALS folks because there's a lot of overlap between them. In some cases, uh, I don't want to overrepresent it, but it seems almost like PLS is a form of ALS where it's not terminal. And that's an oversimplification, but that could mean that there could be power that we need to discover in PLS that can actually help the ALS group. But I heard one of the questions, right? Why just think about it that way? Why just think about how to help ALS when we really need to look at PLS on its own too? So we don't want to have that frustration of just relying upon, well, more people have ALS, so that should be the focus. But there's an enormous amount of funding available. And you saw the ice bucket challenge just a number of years ago you know, like something like $118 million was raised. We can tap into that. The stuff that we learned for ALS should be applied into PLS. So it's okay sometimes to have these group and to kind of ride that wave and to, you know, draft on that a bit. It's okay, right? There's, there's more that we can learn all along. It's all science. And that's, that's sort of that non-directional science bit. We're going to accidentally discover all sorts of important things that are going to have ripple effects in other disease areas. And that's okay. That's power. Um, he was talking about a new PLS rating scale that was developed. And this can be important, again, for clinical trials. Remember, you've got to measure something. So if there's a scale, that's a very important development. It can seem like, well, you know, why bother investing time in developing a scale? It's so that you've got that outcome measure so you can measure against something. So that you can do a natural history study and not have to have a placebo control. You can say, that's the way the disease should progress. But when we're on this drug, it looks measurably different. Right? So that's why that's really important. Um, there was, uh, and obviously this PLS scale, uh, the internal comparisons that it compares favorably between raters, so it's consistent. You don't have variability so that it's actually statistically useful. And that it uh, compares favorably to previously developed tools. Uh, you talked about what's a really important conference, right? The second international PLS conference that was just held back in May. Um, important, highly effective. There was a theme of, you know, what are the causes and pathogenesis of PLS. Uh, There's panel discussions focused in many different areas, uh, commitments to meet every two years, publish meeting notes, and I think very importantly to form an international PLS study group, PLSG. And I think we're going to hear a lot more from PLSG moving forward. Some of the questions that I heard is, you know, we kind of just talked about, right? I mean, why focus on, P on ALS? And I think, again, there's kind of some power there. I don't want to overstate it, but, and we also heard raise your voice. Okay, and we still have to hear from Dr. Fink, so I'll fill you in on my notes after I hear his talk. <laughs> I have far too little time left, and I want to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, so let me literally spend a, a ridiculously short amount of time on gene and cell updates, and it is not going to be complete because there are things that I know that I can't talk about because of confidentiality and because there's a lot of progress that's being made in a serious way. And I, it's, it's just a, a state of the art. Know that there are hundreds of studies going on for gene and cell, pro, gene and cell therapy programs in lots of different disease areas. And HSP and PLS are going to be among them. All right? It's a matter of time. I don't want to overhype the time because it's going to take time. But I think that there are people that have been even pessimistic until the last couple of years that are now coming out of gene and cell therapy meetings invigorated, optimistic, surprised. Um, in some ways, when I first started my graduate work, I thought gene therapy was going to be a, a snap. I mean, how naive of me, right? But it turns out it's not so easy to get stuff where it's got to go and have it do what it's supposed to do to fix those structures and functions. 
in the same way that it's hard to repair your house. You gotta hire a special, you gotta hire a plumber. You gotta hire an electrician if you've got an issue, right? I I, I'm kind of a handyman. I can go and screw things up as, you know, the same as anybody else. But sometimes you make things worse, right? You can cause unintended consequences. You gotta be careful about that. So what I thought when I was a new graduate student, oh, gene therapy, let's just go, you, you've got a DNA sequence issue and that's what makes the proteins? Go change your DNA sequence. Turns out, in some ways, that is easy, but in some ways, you gotta be very careful. And it took years to actually get the right delivery models. And I'll go, I'll go through some of those slides, but very high level, we're now at the point where we do have effective modes to get that DNA changed. But it's gotta be kind of gene by gene by gene by gene. So there's still hard work in front of us, but holy smokes, it's working. And that's pretty darn encouraging. But it takes time. So I'm very encouraged, but anyway, I, 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 don't want, I don't want to dwell on that too much, but that's a theme from the last couple of years. I'll talk about a few different kinds of examples of cell and gene therapies, but really I want to be able to answer questions. So I'm going to go through this very, very briefly. FDA, so a couple of themes from the past few years. This is very similar to what I presented last year, and I hate reusing slides, but it's important information. So there's an FDA willingness, again, that's a theme, to approve innovative therapies. They're getting approved. It's not just being considered. It's not being forced down people's throats. This is working. Doesn't mean there's not a long way to go still, but innovative therapies are being approved. The new models. Investment. Money matters, right? There is money being invested in this area. And that means there's gonna be long-term investment. All right, so about four and a half billion per year, the last couple of years. Last year when I presented this, there was already, I think, three billion just last year at this time, and that's persisting, right? It's not just huge companies one and done. This is consistent investment. It's getting a lot of attention. Hundreds of gene and cell therapy studies, not all of which are public, many of which you can find on pharma companies' websites, but not all. They exist. They're being tested. They're in various stages of preclinical or phase one, two, three clinical trials. Okay? Drugs are being approved that are helping the rare disease populations. It's happening. Here's an example. Now, a few, at least one of these has turned red since last year, right? So just last month, there was an approval for a second, two different therapies for a motor neuron disease spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. And I've talked a lot about SMA. I'm actually on the board of directors for Cure SMA, so I've talked about that probably more than you'd like to, to know, but it's a motor neuron disease. It's not upper motor neurons, but it's a motor neuron disease. There's a lot that's known about getting that drug into the right kind of cells that we can leverage, okay? Now, there's both an antisense oligo. Who knows what an antisense oligo is? I gave you a little bit of preview of DNA what do you think an antisense oligo is? Remember, it's a, uh, DNA is a sequence, A's, G's, T's, and C's. Anybody know what it might be? Remember, DNA is in a helix, and it's complementary. I don't think that I talked about that much. An antisense oligo binds to a particular section of DNA or RNA, and it can influence how much is made. It can shut genes off. It's a therapeutic approach to changing DNA without actually having to change the composition of DNA, right? So it's kind of a transient molecule, but it's stable, within, and we didn't know that it was gonna be stable until it was tested in humans. Again, kind of some of that safety that was tested. That's been approved. And a gene replacement therapy for the first time in kids that are under two has been approved, where you're literally fixing a defective gene. And that's pretty amazing. And that should give us all some hope. Doesn't mean it's gonna to be tomorrow, but it's coming. One of the problems is the price tag. I think you can see it. And I don't wanna scare anybody. I don't wanna freak anybody out. That's one of the reasons we need to be together as an organization. And I'll tell this in, few, in slides that I'm not gonna be able to get to. There are, there's a whole shift in the focus of Cure SMA, which is our equivalent. That's an advocacy group for SMA focused on lobbying in DC, lobbying for access, 
getting reductions in the patient responsible portion of this $2.1 million for this therapy so that it's not falling on a disease population, right? That's not okay. And there's a lot of support for that in Washington, but it doesn't mean that's gonna happen overnight either. There's also sharing where the company that's doing this, which is uh, uh, Avexis, they were bought by Novartis for a very high price tag, it's driving some of that finance, where they're saying, look, if it doesn't work, you're not gonna pay. But that doesn't necessarily cover some of the hospitalization costs and so forth, but here, it's actually an intravenous delivery. You're literally getting this injected, not even intrathecally, not even into your spinal column, it's going into your blood. One and done, actually you can't get treated twice. So that's, that could actually be seen as a negative. But you're literally treated once, gene therapy, and that's it for the rest of your life. As opposed to the other therapy where you literally have to spend about $350,000 over the course of your life per year for continuous treatment, okay? So they're expensive, but they're good, and there's a lot of efforts that are going into making this affordable. So I don't want anybody to be discouraged that when we do fund research for a therapy, and there is a therapy, that we're not gonna be able to afford it. There's a lot of work that's going on. And that's, again, part of the importance, I would say, of a group like this, and they have changing priorities, where we, we become lobbyists in many ways. And we walk through the halls of DC, literally, and we've got focused lobbying efforts to make sure that our collective voices are heard. I mean, it's more than we can do as single individuals. We group together, okay? So I don't want anybody to be discouraged by that. It's all positive. Well, expensive, but it's positive. Okay, so I think that I really want to shift into uh, uh, questions for a few moments, but I, I skipped a whole bunch of slides about how to get genetic payloads to their locations, but I gave some of these slides last year, and so please, look online to some of that material that is relevant. I really wanted to highlight some of the new advances, and, I, and let me just go back to this slide. Things that like, for instance, for ALS, SOD1 is a major cause of ALS. There's a couple of different approaches, a gene replacement therapy and an ALS. Huntington's, huge. Rett syndrome, it's, it's like an unimaginably awful disease. There's, there's some terrible diseases here that are on the chart toward effective therapies. And I think that's probably as, as deep as I can go into that. And I, I can go into it in more detail later. Questions? Sorry, usually I leave a lot more room for questions, but I was trying to cover a lot of material okay, today. Okay, hang on. Wait. If a single treatment is gonna cost four or $500,000, isn't that cheap? Don't you have to deduct what it costs to care for that person for the next two, three, five, ten years? That's, Are you like with dementia? That's part of the argument. That's definitely part of the argument. What would you have paid? But when it's a terminal disease, like for SMA, then you end up literally determining what the value of a life is in, in some of those health economics. But the health economic questions, there are a lot of people that are a lot better at it than me that are focused on that very question. And we're trying to bring to bear all the experts in the field to be able to say, what are the health economics of this piece? And those, those, those conversations are happening all over the globe today. Okay, got a question in the middle. Of the $4.5 billion year investment, what is that? Is that all Novartis and Gilead and, or what, how, how, a lot do, of big you, ones. how do you define or divide? There's a lot of big ones. It's also just investment, right? Some of it is uh, small companies that are going public. We're seeing that on a routine basis. Some of them are mergers and acquisitions. Some of it is literally just what is the level of research and development investment by all of these companies? Some of which are big companies, many of which are medium and small, and I'm working with hundreds of pharma companies of all different sizes on a routine basis, and I'm doing the work for them in my lab. It's one of the things, I'm not a basic researcher. I basically provide services that otherwise these pharma companies might not have, or maybe it's too expensive to bring up in their own labs, and they send their samples to me. So that's what I do. So I know all of this work is happening because they're coming to me looking for me to provide assays for them. So I know that's happening. And they're investing in that. And I monitor that because it's, it's important for my business too. Another question, anybody? I'm going left. <clears throat> okay, who had a hand up over here? There we go. I'll come here first, I'll go left next. Um, like on this uh, gene therapy if there, if they really 
developed a, a treatment for it. Would that, like, if you've got like HSB, would and if you took it, would that fix you, or would it prevent any more damage from happening in the future? That is an extraordinarily good question. And I don't have a great answer. And it may depend upon the disease, right? So just kind of to qualify it, I don't know about the future. But I can tell you that when there was a treatment for SMA, they had done small studies, but not huge studies. And it got approved by the FDA anyway. It's part of you know, the, the new mentality of the FDA. And when they started treating bigger and bigger populations that were older and older that already had significant decay of symptoms. Spinal muscular atrophy, there, there's, there's actually loss of neurons, right? There was more restoration, even in adults, than anyone expected. Nobody expected the FDA to necessarily approve it for all ages. They did not approve it for the gene therapy. They approved it for all ages for that initial therapy. And it had more impact than anybody dared to dream. That's not to say that for an HSP gene therapy, there would be reversal of symptoms. Um, but you know, if you think about what a therapy does, this gene replacement therapy, you've got to think about, all right, so you've got a DNA change. I, I mentioned that, right? That influences the protein. Imagine all of the three trillion cells that this has to get into, and those specific cells, your upper motor neurons, to enable improvement of disease. You gotta have the stuff that I didn't cover in, in, in the slides get to the right spot, and correct the issue, and have that improve the function of that cell. And maybe it only has to happen in 10% of your upper motor neurons. I don't know what the number is. But if it happens, the better it happens, the more complete the response is going to be. I would say you know, you would, it would certainly keep you from getting worse. It might, there might still be some decline if the targeting is inefficient and it's only impacting, if it's impacting fewer cells than you would hope. So you would, you would expect maybe a slower rate of decline, maybe a plateau. What they saw in SMA was improvement when they didn't necessarily know if there would be. So again, I don't want to sugarcoat it, but you know, that's, that's some of the experience that we've seen. And there may be others, uh, you know, Dr. Blackstone and others, and, and, and Dr. Fink that would say it differently, and I'd encourage them to do so now. But that's, that's the experience that I'm drawn upon. Hey, Corey, we got one over here on, the, on, the, on your right. Hey, thank, thank you, sir, for all the information. Um, our son uh, is 12 years old, and uh, two years ago, he was diagnosed with SPG 31. Uh, but the doctors were also telling us that, that it's SPG 13. Uh, is that possible? Does that make sense? I'd want to see the report there. We can, we've got people that can help that. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that writes those reports. I'm not the clinician, right? So I talked to Dr. Fink about you know, symptoms and, and reconciling a report that you got with the symptoms themselves, because that's really important to do. But if there's literally kind of like a typo or a mistake or something, I, I, can, I can help take a look at that and we can see. But I, I can tell you that the places that are doing diagnostic assays for these genes are amazing. And the chances that those are mistakes are remote. There's always some chances of, of errors, but they are extraordinary companies all doing extraordinary work. So I, I'd say that there's, there's very high fidelity there. And you can have a high degree of confidence in the results. Hey, Corey, I think we've got time for one more. And I got a hand that's close to me, so I got to go here. Sorry for the few, very few questions. I, I'd like to leave more time. Quick follow-up to his question made me think, are you hoping in the future that, say, if my granddaughter showed up with the same defective gene I have, if she were to have the gene therapy before she had children, would it be possible that the next generation would Good not question. have this? The answer is no. Gene therapy is not intended to impact your sperm or eggs. The idea is it affects what we call somatic cells, which is everything except sperm and eggs. And usually I have slides that kind of talk about you know, sperm and eggs and how special they are and, 
and how that's important for propagating into the next generation. The idea is not to impact those cells. So those folks would still need to get a therapy. Okay? It's not correction of a germline mutation. That's not the intended purpose. It's to affect you as an individual and all of the cells that present your symptoms. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. okay, everybody. Dr. Corey Brostad.